Company in Dallas, Texas. Garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. <laughs> you hear the thunder, the thunder and lightning in the garage tonight. You know, Captain, I have to admit, when we get to Texas, it's very hard to select a beer for the show. They make such great beer down in Texas. There's great so brews. many to mm. choose from. This is just another great one. So make sure you try some off the leash Texas Red Ale. And thanks for everybody for filling up the fridge. A big shout out to Rebecca out in Kansas. Next, we have Haley in Onalaska, Wisconsin. And Judy out in Kalana, Illinois. I think that's how you say it. We like your gym. And a big shout out to Anna from London. She says that she loves the way that we pronounce British place names. <laughs> I think she means how we mispronounce the British place names. Thank you, Anna. And we have Heather in our hometown, Seabus or Columbus. She's suggesting that we do a meetup at one of our fine breweries. We also want to give a shout out to Kayla and Jordan up in Michigan. You know, I love that we have so many couples that listen together to the garage. And last but not least, we have Adam in Shreveport, Louisiana. Well, that's just so romantic. So thanks, everybody, for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. For everything, social media, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff, at True Crime Garage. And that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Grab your lover's hand. Mary Horton Vale died and passed away in October of 1962. She was found dead in a river near her home in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Sharon Hensley, she's been missing since February of 1973. She went missing off the coast of Key West, Florida. Annette Carver Vale, missing since October 1984 from Tulsa, Oklahoma. What's the one thing that these women have in common? They were all married or had an intimate relationship with Felix Vale. Gina, we've been talking about Felix Vale, and earlier we covered the mysterious death of his first wife. Now, you said that they had had a son together, and she died just months after he was born. What ever become of his son? Oh, gosh, Bill, his son, Bill, was Bill was born, I think, in July, and... His first wife, Mary, was killed in October. So he was literally months, four months old, I think. And so Bill has an aunt in Louisiana that takes him and keeps him for a while. Not, not a long while, maybe a year. And then Bill takes him and moves back home to Mississippi with his mom and dad and stays there for a little while, maybe a year, maybe two, not very long. And so his mom probably is raising the son. Then Felix takes off and heads to California. This is when he really starts just traveling all over, very nomadic, like I've said. And he takes off and goes to California. At some point, he comes back and he gets his child, Bill, this toddler, and he says, hey, this is my kid. I'm taking my kid. I'm going to be the dad, you know. Bullshit. He took that kid because he goes out to California, he's living the true hippie lifestyle, and they're, they're roaming around, you know, the Haight-Ashbury district, I mean, everything. It's, it's definitely, you know, the Time Life magazine of the hippie lifestyle. That's what Felix is doing at this stage. But he learned quickly that he could take his son Bill and use him as a pawn to get the things he needed to survive, okay? Um, housing, food, women, drugs, whatever it is he needs. Oh, look at me. I'm a single dad. Um, I mean, it's the ultimate chick magnet. Look at me. I'm a single dad with this little, you know, toe-headed baby, and, and oh, my wife tragically died by accidental drowning, and I'm just trying to survive, and, you know, here, light up and pop this, and we'll babysit your kid while you go screw her and you know whatever and it was i mean unfortunately for bill but it was genius on felix's part it really was for the deviant piece of shit that he is it was a genius move so felix has his son bill with him but they're they're definitely not living a traditional home family lifestyle 
and Bill stays with him till he's like eight or nine or so. But what what happens at this point? Little Bill, bless his heart, he says they're on this orchard in California, in Merced, California. And he said, there's this little farm boy that he's talking to, and he's like, you know, I just, I don't like living like this. I want a home. I want to eat. I haven't eaten in two weeks. I've had nothing but grapes for two weeks, literally. And this farm boy said, you should go to the police and tell him. So Bill literally gets on the road and walks like two or three miles down the road and finds the police station and says, hey, my dad is doing all this. I'm tired of taking drugs. I mean, sad, tragic, tragic story. I'm tired of living this way. Oh, by the way, I heard him tell his girlfriend that he killed my mom. And the police were like, whoa. So that's the first time the investigation is reopened into Mary Vale's death, okay? And this is 1970. Louisiana comes to California, interviews. I don't know what happened, but nothing happened. It just, it, it was dead in the water. A horrible choice of words right there. But um, The police hear this, this story from this little boy that, that his father had killed his mom. And now they're going to go talk. They're going to go talk to Felix. They put them on. What they do is they go and they find Felix and Sharon, and they're like, "Hey, your kid just ratted you out." They check them out. They got all these pills on them. I don't know what kind of pills they were. I don't. I think it was LSD. I don't know what they had on them, but they had drugs on them. So they charge them, convict them for drugs, and that's when he gets put on probation. And his mom, I think, bailed him out. You know, they get they get money to get bailed out of jail, and his mom did it. Well, at that stage, Bill, his son, goes back to Mississippi and lives with Felix's mom and dad and was, from that point on, raised by his mom and dad. Um, Felix showed up, I don't know, a year later. Him and Sharon show up at the farm, and Bill sees him and is just petrified, totally petrified, because he's afraid that his dad is going to kill him because he turned him over to the police. You got a feel for this little boy here. What ends up happening with Bill? And so Bill, his son, was raised in a Christian home and went on to college, met a Christian woman. They married. They were strong Christians. Unfortunately, Bill passed away, I think it was in 2009, of cancer. But he had a family of his own, uh, I think three sons, basically really didn't have anything to do with his dad because he knew the truth. In fact, there's we have an audio tape of Bill talking to his preacher at his church because he knew, I think at this stage he knew he wasn't going to live that much longer because of the cancer they had. And so he, he told his preacher to audio tape this confessional, you know, and, and talks about his growing up and how he was treated by his dad and this being drugged all over the state of California, you know, living in a tent, and then turned him in and the confession that he made. Because when Felix told Sharon that he killed his mother, Bill heard that. But Felix didn't know he heard it until Bill went to the cops in Merced, California and turned him in. That's when he found out. And that's why when Felix showed up that very first time back at the farm, Bill was so scared he thought he was going to kill him because of what he did, you know, what he had said to the cops. But that that time he showed up, Sharon was already gone. And he told Bill, he said, you don't have to worry about her anymore. I fixed her, something along the lines of I fixed her to where she won't tell anybody anything. So Felix, having killed his first wife, do you think... Gina, do you think that once he met these other women and once they became involved with him in a long-term relationship, that Felix was of the mindset that, you know, I'm just going to use this person up and however this relationship ends, it's going to end on my terms. You know, did he, was their fate sealed when they met him and got involved with him? Were they already dead in his mind at the end of that relationship? Yeah. You know, I'm going to be on the fence on that one, and I know that's the dumbest answer you could hope for. The reason I say that is 
back in the very beginning when I first met him, I would have said, oh, yeah, definitely. But, you know, you're young and eager in the case, and, you know, it's early on, and you're like, oh, yeah, this guy just set out to kill all these women. I don't think that's the case, to be honest with you. And the reason I say that today is because since then I have learned that there were so many other women. He was married like seven times. And there were so many other women from the death of his first wife, Mary Horton Vale, to after the disappearance of Annette Vale, his third, his last wife, or the, that's, yeah, I think that is his last wife, but after the disappearance of Annette, that there were so many other women that we were unaware of until just in the past year, maybe two, that he had a long-term relationship with. He married them, and there was domestic violence, but they were able to escape. So he didn't set out thinking like the one woman, and I, I, I won't divulge their names because they are still around, they're still living, and the privacy issues. If it's out there in the media, go after it, that's great, but I'm not going to be the one to put it out there. Um, but these women, one woman, you know, he was choking in the shower, and it was upstairs, and, and her brother was downstairs, and he heard the commotion, he comes up, and him and Felix get in a fight, you know, he's saving his sister. So if one, if her brother wasn't there, he, he could have very easily, and he probably would have killed her. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have killed her. But I don't think he set out in that relationship saying, okay, when I'm done with her and used her up and got all I can out of her, I'm going to kill her. I don't think that's his intention. I think what happened is when the when he, because all of these other women that are still out there that had a relationship with him, whether they experienced domestic violence at his hands or not, I think... I don't think he set out to kill each one of them to end the relationship, but I think if he was in it long enough, they were very short relationships. One woman he was married to for one month. You know, one woman he was with for a couple of months. They were very, very short relationships. I think if they were a year or better, they would have ended up dead. Gina, with all of your experience, and I know you've covered a lot of domestic cases during your career and some of them turn violent. What is the difference between Felix, who is a killer, and someone that is just prone to violence? There there are men out there that that will beat the shit out of their girlfriend or wife, and they there's a certain threshold they, they'll stop at. Felix, you know, you push that button, and they're like, okay, you're getting the shit beat out of you. And I might break your nose and bust your lip, but I'm going to stop when, I'm, when I feel like you've had enough. Felix doesn't stop until they're dead. That's the difference. Once that button of his is pushed, he carries it through to the end. Those women that are still living are lucky. I believe there's one more victim out there. That's a good possibility. I mean, given the the length of this timeline here and with how many women he claims to have had relationships with, we've seen how some of these have ended. But why do you believe there's another victim out there? The whole time I talked to him, he only said one name completely. I've never been able to find her, and piecing things together, my theory is that it was after the disappearance of Sharon, but before he met Annette. So in the 70s, he was traveling and hiking through Colorado, and he met up with a group of people, and this is stuff he told me, and he, he was very much into live food. Me, and, of course, I'm like, live food, what are you talking about? You eat, you catch a rabbit and just eat it and not kill it? I mean, what do you do? You know, what are you talking about? And, no, live food, the way he explains it is you go, again, like to an orchard, you know, grape vineyard, and you pull the grapes right off the tree and you eat them right there. That's as fresh as they can be. Okay, that makes sense. I asked him, I said, well, do you ever have, again, it was one of those times I wanted to provoke him and see what he would say. Do you ever eat meat? I mean, how do you do live food if you're eating meat? Well, he steered clear of it, and then I asked him again at another stage in the conversation, and I said, what do you eat, like sushi? Is that live food, you know, as a joke? And he said no, but he during this camping trip in Colorado, and his whole life was like a extended camping trip, I think. At one point he tells me about a woman he met up with, and, of course, I have to hear all the graphic details about all the sex they had while they're camping and, you know, all the detail about that. And then at another stage of the conversation when I'm talking about the live food 
and I jokingly talk about sushi, you know, and meat, he makes a reference, it's a weird reference, and he says, no, but, you know, I've tried it once before, and um, it's just it just wasn't totally my thing. And I got the feeling that it was while he was with these people in Colorado, and he was talking about drinking blood, and he claims it was an animal, but he wasn't very clear. He was very, very vague about all of this. So my assumption is I, I can't help but wonder. Wait, 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 wait. Wait a second. So what are you saying? Are you saying that Felix killed a woman and then drank her blood? Did he push this woman to the edge and kill her and decide just to try it, you know, just to see what it was like? He was very, I believe him when he said, I tried it and I didn't like it. I do believe that. But what was it that he tried? Because he wasn't specific. He didn't say, oh, it was a doe, it was a rabbit, it was a squirrel. He just said it was an animal, you know, he was... And he is a very, he's very detail-oriented, but he was very vague in that. So I, I, it's in your mind, you know. But I couple that with this story he tells me about this woman and the fact that I can't find her anywhere in existence at all. And he was smitten by her, and it all coincides together. And I can't help but wonder if she's another victim that has just been never been identified. And it would be very easy for her to slip through the cracks because she came from Sweden, according to him. And they immediately connected, and she, you know, went her separate way, you know, his cryptic ending of the relationship. It was very similar. Yeah, we see this time and time again with Felix. He has these lengthy relationships with these women, and then they just supposedly leave on their own, yet they're never seen or heard from again. And I just wonder if that and the Colorado trip and the live food with the blood and everything all coincides. The timing just fits. So that's that's that story for what it's worth. Was there anything incriminating that Felix had said to you? Or what did you get from him that they were able to use at his trial? Um, he didn't tell me anything that was used in court or that could have been used in court that was beneficial to the, the case. However, when he was arrested, I was able to continue the undercover operation for several months after that by writing letters and then talking to him on the phone from jail. He would call me, you know. The reason I did that was because we knew the journals were there, the but we, we couldn't get to them. And law enforcement had come down in May to arrest him. And they had a warrant, obviously for his arrest, but then they had a warrant to search his property for the journals. Well, they were from Louisiana. And in the state of Texas, there's some law that does not allow journals to be obtained with the search warrant. Whatever the law is, you know, I don't I don't know. Those that's for the attorneys. So they come down here, and this warrant says, you know, what we're looking for are personal journals and letters and things like that. And the judge here in Texas said, nope, not signing off on this because it's against our law. Okay, fine. So basically, all they could do is they all they could do was arrest him, and that's all they did. Their warrant won't allow them to get the journals, but you've established a relationship with him. You think you can get this information? So I wrote him a letter in jail, and I said. I said, hey, I can't. at this stage in our relationship, our plan was, I told him I was divorced and that I didn't have custody of my kid, and I had gotten a big inheritance, and I bought an RV, and I was just going to go sit at the beach and, you know, disconnect. And I wanted him to come with me, and of course he was all over that. And so that's how we left it. And then, of course, when he's getting arrested, then I said, uh, how do I make contact with him to let him know that, hey, I'm still here, and just see what happens? Because I was there when he was arrested. I was taking the pictures. But I had a hat on. I had my hair pulled back. I had a big camera in front of my face. So he didn't know it was me. But at the time, I didn't know that he didn't know it was me. I wasn't sure. So I wrote him a letter as my character, and I said, hey, I went by to see you. Your neighbor said you got arrested. I saw it on the Internet. Oh, my God, what happened? 
and he immediately writes back and he's like, "Oh, it's so great to hear from you. I, you know, I'm getting railroaded and it's a conspiracy." You know, that's been his story the whole time. So I knew that he didn't know that was me behind the camera. So I was like, "Okay, let's ride this pony out and see how long it'll last." So I thought I've got to get permission to get into onto his property. That's all I needed. Once I'm on there, I'll do whatever the hell I want. So I asked him, I said, where's your truck? What do you need me to do? Do I need to go and, like, turn off the electricity or carry out trash or anything? What do I need to do? I'm I'm at your disposal. And so he writes back. He said, yes. He said, I want you to go and get my truck. It's impounded at the sheriff's department. And then the keys for everything is on, is on the truck key ring. Go to my place. Then, of course, he had this, like, honey-do list, you know, mow the grass and patch a hole in the roof, and there's a tree that fell over that needs to be righted. All these things, and I'm thinking, I'm not doing that shit. You know, I'm going in, I'm going to snoop through everything, so whatever. And so, of course, I'm all over it. And at this point, we're writing, and he's calling me. So every Saturday, he would call me, and then I'd get probably a letter a week from him. So it took about a week, 10 days to get, you have to get permission, you know, signed to release the truck to me. So I get that, and I go on a Friday afternoon, and my husband had taken me over there. You know, he'd followed me, and we dropped my car, because I wasn't going to take anything off the property. I didn't have permission to remove anything. I wasn't going to remove everything. But I was going to photograph every damn thing the man owned. So I went prepared, and that's exactly what I did. And the first day I get over there, it's about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and my husband had left me there and with my vehicle, and he had taken off and went back home. So I'm looking, 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 and I'm just, I'm not, I'm looking for the journals, and I'm not finding them at all. And so I called my husband, and I said, hey, we're, I'm not finding them. I'm going to go on. It's like 10 o'clock at this point. I said, I'm going to go on and come home. And I'll just come back tomorrow because there are a few things I hadn't looked through. Well, there was this one tote, like a big plastic storage tote, that I kept overlooking because I thought tools were in it. From another time that I was in there, it looked like tools were in this tote. So I just kept ignoring it. and But I kept going back to it. So I thought, I'm just going to look in there. And there was stuff piled on it. So I set the stuff aside. I opened it, and it's full of all his journals. It's just like you know, 30 journals in there, the mother load. And so, of course, I'm ecstatic at this point. This was in a part of the shed that was a storage room on the back side, but there was no locking door or anything. So I put it inside the main part of the shed so I could lock it up because I I didn't know what was going to happen. He had been arrested about two or three weeks at this point, and I didn't know if there were going to be vandals, you know, somebody torched the place. I didn't know, you know. So I wanted to secure them as best I could without removing them from the property. So I did. And I go back the next day, and I spent 16 hours photographing all the journals. Because also, I didn't know when or if my cover was going to be blown. And once he tells me, you cannot go back on the property, I couldn't go back on the property without trespassing, obviously. My main goal was to get all the data from the journals as fast as possible. And that's what I did that Saturday. I went back and it was 16 hours and I just started photographing pages, page after page, and every single page that he wrote down, I photographed. And then he had a little file cabinet and I went through there and he had things that were important to the trial, like Annette's original birth certificate he had, um, the letters that he had written to his mother about the disappearance of Sharon. He had the original letters there. Things like that. So I took photographs of all that. So those came into play during the trial. We'll get right back to Gina Frenzel, private investigator, investigating serial killer Felix Vale right after this quick beer break. I've been preaching it over and over, episode after episode, mental health. We all need to take better care of ourselves, and taking care of our mental health is no exception. That's why I use Talkspace. And that's why today's sponsor, Talkspace, the online therapy company, makes it easy to connect with experienced, licensed therapists handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Now, most therapy is 
It's not convenient and it's pretty pricey. Not with Talkspace. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist a text, audio, video message, whenever you want. You can even do a live chat. If you want to vent about work, family, or talk through something that's been on your mind, no problem. Your therapist is ready to help. You can even just talk to them about putting you on a path to a happier life. And to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash garage. And as a special offer to our listeners, you can use our coupon code garage to get $30 off your first month and show your support to this podcast. That's promo code garage at Talkspace.com slash garage. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. Sockclub.com. You know, Father's Day is June 18th. And as we all know, dad can be the hardest family member to shop for. But think about it before you buy something for dad. What is dad? Who is he? He's a practical man, right? So you want to get him something that he will use. And because it's from you, he will love it. And that's why Sock Club is here to help. Sock Club is the Sock of the Month subscription service that sends a pair of quality American-made socks straight to your door every month. This is a little gift with a huge gift impact because each delivery brings a brand new, never-before-seen sock design specifically created for that month. I love getting my socks every month. It's a gift that keeps giving. I love Sock Club because the socks feel great. They have a new design every month, and they show up to my door every month. And maybe you've waited to the last minute to get something for Dad for Father's Day. Well, you don't have to worry about that because Sock Club, they do printable membership certificates that are available anytime. So you can look like an expert gift giver. As a special offer to our listeners, you can get 15% off when you go to SockClub.com and use our promo code GARAGE at checkout. That's SockClub.com promo code GARAGE. Give a delightful gift experience. Give comfy feet every month. Give Sock Club this Father's Day. What are in Felix's journals? They're, the minutia in those journals, it's just, it's nauseating. There's so much. He, you know, I woke up today at 7.45. I had a banana and blueberry smoothie. At 8.45, I did 72 sit-ups. And, I mean, it's it's ridiculously mundane. But then every once in a while, he'll just interject something, and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. So it's almost like you have to go through them all. And I'll be real honest with you, I have not read them all. The very first journal entry is December 31st, 1984. Annette disappeared in October of 1984. Everything prior to that is missing. It's gone. And then you get into the 90s, and there's a couple of years missing. But then, then it starts back up again, and you're like, wait a minute. So we kind of figured out a pattern that obviously he got rid of things that were incriminating. In the 90s, he dated this woman, and there was some domestic violence, I think, associated with it. And so my assumption is, okay, obviously he wrote about it, and he thought, oh, I'm going to get rid of it, and got rid of it. And I thought to myself, why, for for like a year, I thought to myself, why is it that every single thing from 1984 back is just missing? And right, we need to find stuff prior to 1984 because this is when these disappearances and the murders took place. So you're able, through reading his journals, to figure out that there's a time period where he moves back into his parents' home. And he had always kept a lot of his things at his parents' home. After his mother passes away, he has to leave. So you're able to trace these things to the attic of his parents' home. And didn't you come across a section in his journals where he talks and discusses about getting rid of these items? All of the things he has kept in his parents' attic forever and ever, which were the journals. And he's burning them. And he's reminiscing as he's burning them. And one of the things, and it's really, it's insignificant stuff, except one section. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he, he basically, he says, you know, with this whole family situation of arguing with, you know, there was, uh, there was a family member by the nickname of Bunchy arguing with Bunchy and, you know, his wife and, you know, about the estate and all this, I have learned to, and then also reflecting back on everything in my past life, 
while I'm reading the journals and then burning them. He's basically saying all this in his journal. He And this is not a paraphrase. He says, I have learned how to resolve conflict without resorting to murder. We were thankful enough that Gina sent us a bunch of the audio from her undercover work when she was sitting with Felix in his home, interviewing him. He's being recorded. He does not know. Uh, We found this next clip to be very insightful regarding his character. Swear on their life that our government never has or never will have a, a squad to kill people. Suicide. I mean, you know, like yeah. a, a assassination squad. Yeah. They, they, they think the Arabs do, or everybody what, else. What the government's Hitler, actually doing? Hitler and, and uh, Russia. And really? All, oh, shit. Our government's got so many different... Well, the recon marines is one. one and he was, a, he was a recon marine. Is yeah. that what scared you about it? No. Oh. I'd be scared. Hell no. yeah. No, it's just... Uh, the thing that scared me about him and her both was these uh, these blind spots that their ego protects. Oh, that yeah. They're willing to fight to the death to protect yeah. you from attacking those blind spots. Yeah. They don't want to hear about it. They Did they ever come after you physically? No. Oh, it's just a no. verbal type of attack? Uh, uh, that would be he, scary. He, he uh, he thought about it. You really? He thought about it a couple of times, and oh my God. I reminded him who I am, and so that's all it took. Oh. He, he's he's scared of me. He doesn't know. He doesn't know how much I know about killing myself. You know about killing people, yeah. hurting, pain, whatever, incapacitating. And I don't know. I've studied ten, fifteen different forms of martial arts. That gives us a chance to hear Felix's voice, to get a get a feel for his mannerisms and how he's talking to Gina and, and some of the conversations they had. The thing here is, though, he the, the important thing is listen to how he responds when somebody has a problem with him. There's a guy that has a problem with him from a previous relationship, and he states, that guy does not know what I know about killing, about killing people. Very telling about Felix's character. Unfortunately, Gina did not get that smoking gun material from Felix. He never stated anything that was highly incriminating regarding the death of his first wife, his second wife, or the disappearance of any other woman. However, there were some things that she was able to provide to the state that they used as evidence at his trial. As far as the undercover work, there was no confession There was no smoking gun or anything like that, unfortunately. However, there were several things that I found that that they were able to introduce, like the letters that he wrote about the disappearance of Sharon, the fact that he had Annette's um, original birth certificate, and her passport picture, um, those types of things. That was key because they were able to introduce this law, and I think it's like a 404B or 401B, I can't remember the name of it, but basically it allows the state to introduce during the trial previous bad acts, and part of that was the disappearance of Sharon and Annette, and part of their disappearance and their story of the disappearance were the inconsistencies of the, you know, the letter that I found and the passport photo and the original birth certificate you know he says oh she took off with these guys to travel all over well she didn't have her passport she didn't have her birth certificate and at that time she didn't have a driver's license so those were her identifications and she didn't have them with her you know those types of things so that was what i was able to bring to the table as far as my undercover work on the case felix vale is arrested for the murder of his first wife mary horton vale before the trial takes place Gina is in town. Now, she suspects that her cover may have been blown because at this point, we have newspaper articles. There's all kinds of stories coming out about this case. She goes to the prison to speak with Felix and confront him to find out if he knows what she knows. How are you? I'm I'm not very good. How are you? Uh, (laughs) Me neither. Me neither. But I'm here right now. So uh, what's going on? What's, What's the deal? 
nothing, just the circus. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like this is not the country I was born in. Yeah. Well, what, what, I want to know, I mean, I want to know what's happening. What? I don't know. I, I, my best guess is that it's uh, some kind of circus, um, you know, that I have gotten plucked up into. Yeah, uh, I, I, you know. It, it's, it's not, there's no real legal stuff going on. They have, they, they're. There's a lot of stuff out there. I know, and it's all bullshit. Uh, there's, uh, what, what they're saying yeah, that I did didn't even happen, and I well, never. What did happen? Uh, nothing. Nothing happened. Uh, you know, uh, my wife fell out of a boat 50 years ago and drowned in a river, and and that's the only thing that they're even that's even halfway factual. What about the other women? What about them? Yeah. What about them? I don't know. I, I mean, I've dated like uh, several hundred, maybe in my lifetime. I'm well, I 74. Don't I, don't I don't know where any of them are. I don't. I, I've never, you know, there's a couple of them that I found mentally interesting, and I, I, had an, I made an agreement with them. That, what do you mean an agreement? Uh, <laughs> an agreement that, that we would look each other up in about five years and have some conversation to see what either of us had had learned in the yeah. meantime. If you know, and and th that never happened. None of them. Well, I did. I, I looked one of them up, and Who? I'm not going to tell you anything. I mean, I, I I looked one of them up, and and she was married to a guy and didn't want to have any conversation with me. So that was it. I'm, mean, you know, about a five-minute visit where I met her husband and hugged them both. And, and uh, was, that, was that your wife and that? No, no. That, that was not. Uh, There's just so much out there in the media. There's so. Oh, I don't care. Listen, listen. I, I don't have. I know. That's why I want you to tell me what's I don't have, what's the I truth. don't have a, 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 a computer. Because ninety, I don't know what percentage, but a way majority of the information out there on the net is just stuff that people are playing with. And well, then tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. What? What happened? What? What do you mean? You don't know? I don't know. Where did she go? I don't know. I don't know where any of them went or are. I, you know, I found them. I, every woman that I have ever been with. I left them when I left them, or they left me. Well, they, were, they, they were healthier and smarter than when I met them. That's well, what, the about, only, what about... That's the only common denominator there is. Well, you know, you're the common denominator. Well, sure. You know? What, I mean, tell, are, me, tell me what, why are they pointing the finger at you with Sharon and Annette also? They're saying that you had something to do with them disappearing. Why? Why Why did the three people who started the rumor that there was foul play when my wife, first wife, fell out the boat, why did those three people get together and what start three to... people? Uh, one of them that was in the boat that picked her up that wanted to screw her before I married her and resented the hell out of the fact that I got her and he didn't, okay? That's one. Another one was... Yeah, you can't. Uh, listen, wait a minute. I'm getting there. Okay. Another one was an insurance adjuster or whatever. We had travel insurance because we were had been in Mexico and we're going again, mm -hmm. all right? So he didn't want to pay off any kind of policies. So he got together with the guy in the boat, and they found another guy who was a hotshot lawyer, fresh out of, had to be fresh out of lawyer school at the time, mm -hmm. whose wife had come to my bed before she married him and didn't tell him about it until after they were married. And so he was gunning for me also. Those three people got together. And they convinced the district attorney at that time to do, you know, to try to put together a case against okay. me. All right, look, they tried. 
they went, they got four deputies to go beat in the bushes and talking to all kind of people. Yeah, I'm and all right, they those four deputies did tried to do the same thing that this little writer out of Jackson, Gary Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's slime ball. Uh, these four deputies tried to do the same thing that he did, except they didn't have his talent. That guy's got some. Okay, talent. but that was 51 years ago. Okay, so what? So now they've 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 reopened, obviously reopened this case, and they've. Oh, look, okay, listen. There was no case. They tried to make a case. Those four deputies. Well, you wouldn't be sitting here if they didn't have something to put you here with. I'm they trying to tell you. I'm trying bullshit. to tell you. Listen, they, they go to court on facts. I know exact. No, they don't. Not here. This is Calcasieu Parish, Louisiana. Wake up. <laughs> wake up. You know what? You wake up. I've seen the pictures of Mary's body. Yeah. Yeah. Have you? No, I haven't. Ask your attorney, because I've seen them. Okay, so what? So what? What about them? Ask your attorney. You need to see those pictures. Who took them? I don't know who took them, but they were taken 51 years ago when her body was pulled out of that river. All right. Who, who took them, though? I don't know. Did the coroner take them? I have no idea. The coroner? The coroner? No, they were not taken by the coroner because she wasn't even out of the river yet. Okay, so they can't use them in court. I don't know. I have no idea. I do. They're using them anyway. But they think I'm they think I'm ignorant enough not to know that. Well when you look at those pictures, that sure as hell doesn't look like an accident to me. Have you ever seen a floater that came out of the Calcasieu River with all the debris and sunken barges and everything it's got on the bottom of it? Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. Well, I, I have I'm not talking about scrapes and scratches and crab bites and things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Well you need to see those pictures. I, I I have not seen them yet. I would like to see them. So what? Tell me about Sharon. I don't know anything about Sharon. You're telling me that she just you know the story is that she just sailed off into the I don't know wild where she, blue I yonder. don't know where she is or where she went any more than I do any of the other 200 or whatever. I I'm not talking know. about the 200. And, 300, 400 million. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, at like one time I tried to count them up and I lost count at about 200 in in my lifetime. Is that, that's irrelevant. I'm talking about the ones that are in the media. Okay, yeah, in the media, I don't know. I don't know any more about them than I do the others. What about the jacket that Mary was wearing, that white jacket that she was wearing? I don't know anything about it. I don't remember. You I sure have talked about it. I have not remembered what kind of clothes she had on. I don't. I had no idea that she had a scarf on. I didn't remember that. You, your original statements to the police said that she was wearing a jacket when you lost, and when her this, body was this pulled week, out. This week? No. I oh. didn't say this week. I said your state, your original statement to the police 50 years ago. Oh, and, and the accident? She was wearing a jacket. In the accident report? Yeah. And well, she, then, then that's probably accurate. I don't remember. Well, her body, she didn't have a jacket. What happened to it? I don't know. I didn't I didn't remember that she had one on. I mean, if, if, if I said that at the time, then she probably did. Well, she was wearing a jacket, and they find her body, and she doesn't have a jacket on. Okay, well, I don't know anything about that. And then, Sharon, you have different stories. You have different stories of who she left with. I don't know who, she, I don't remember who she left with. I gave it my best shot when her mother, uh, who she didn't like, her mother shipped her off. She got pregnant. Her mother yeah, shipped, that. shipped her off and, and, you know, to avoid religious embarrassment because her mother was really strict. But that's irrelevant. That was long after y'all got Well, okay, she, you know, Sharon didn't want to be around. I went with Sharon one time to visit her folks, and they... They had, uh, you know, we were there a couple of days, I think, and she tried to have one conversation with her mother that did not work out very well and didn't try anymore. She talked with her brother some, and her father probably about the same amount that she did with her mother, which was like uh, 15 minutes or something. So what happened? What happened? Why did she just take off? Where did she take off from? I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, you know, some some place where boats were that we were playing with some boat people. What were their names? Because you said 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. I I I probably I might have guessed at the time that I tried to you know I mean at the time I don't think you would know. No, I I didn't want to go with them. Oh, I'm not taking issue with the fact you didn't want to go they, with them. They they were swinging people and I didn't want to go with them. I didn't I take issue with I the fact know. that you I didn't don't know them. what their names were. You knew back then. I don't know that I did. I I, I might have. Okay. I I gave it my best shot. And what about Annette? You said you put her on a bus in St. Louis. I remember that, yes. Uh, but I don't know I don't know the names of the people that she left with. She left with people on a bus. Well, yeah, you know. Like people she knew? No, we had just met them at the zoo. We were walking around at the zoo, and we met these people. There were uh, three guys, three guys, and Two girls, one girl, two girls. Well, why would she three, put on a bus guys, with people she didn't guys, know? Uh, uh, they were going to, to uh, South America, you know. Yeah. They, they were going south. Well, why, would she she, get, why would she leave with people? She wanted to go know? south. She was ready. Why didn't you go with her? I, uh, we, we had, uh, you know, listen, she... The only reason we married was so that she wouldn't get taken away from me while we were traveling. Okay. At one one point we were in some country and um, when we weren't married and they almost took her away from me. Okay, well I can understand that. All right, so what anyway, I'm saying is why why would she why would you not go with her? Y'all were together for a long time. Oh no, um, we were together off and on, like just, just like Sharon and I and several other women. That, that traveled with me or stayed periods of time with me, then they would go be with other people for periods of time, and they would some of them would come back, you know. Annette and Sharon were two of the ones that periodically would come look me up wherever I was. Well, I thought, I, I got the impression that Annette and were they, together all the time. Because they, oh, no, 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 no. So, so when she just, she just gets on the bus and says, I'm going to go, with these people I just met. So well, okay. sure, she had done it before. And that was the last time you saw her? Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, I don't believe that. Well, you don't have to believe it. I don't care who believes it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just shooting from the hip. I have been from the start. Yeah? Not not, not like you, of course, shooting from the hip. I know. Mean, you know, it's your job. No, I am pretty... Pretty I'm dead not, on, and I get what I'm going after. I, I, I hope you're getting paid well. No, nope, not a single dime. Not a single dime. Yeah? Yeah. Huh. What's your motive? Justice. Whoa, you're in the wrong place. I don't think so. Calpy Sioux Parish, Louisiana? I think I'm in the right place. I'm on this side of the glass. Ju- justice is a joke here. They make up their own. They make up their own laws. They're breaking several federal laws by even having me in here. No, they've got not. no. They've got no probable cause. There's nothing. The well, probable have. cause. They have sexual evidence, Felix. Sexual evidence. Factual oh, evidence. Fact. They have no factual evidence of of anything. Yeah, they do, or they wouldn't have been able to get an indictment on you. That's not true. Yeah. In any other place, it would be true. You know what I, I was told? You know that that's I know that I'm the only person that really knows they have nothing because nothing I have done nothing bad to anybody. Yeah, you have. No, listen, I slapped one woman in my life. And what about was, okay? Okay, let, let me tell you. You this. tell me then. Who was that woman? I'm not going to tell you who it was, but she slapped me three times. Was first. it Beth? Field? No, no, no. She slapped me three times first. And I told her each time, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. Third time, I slapped her so she would stop slapping me. Okay, that's the one woman I have ever hit. And it's not that Okay, no, listen. There was two different times. I I studied martial arts when I I wanted to travel. I didn't want to be paranoid about getting robbed. So, and I've only had to use it twice. One time... Three guys jumped me coming out of a restaurant with a date. They were going to knock me out and take my date and my money. And and they 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 were listen. They were not successful with that. Another time, I was walking down the street with a woman, a date, and four guys jumped me. 
and they were not successful either. I waltzed them all, and three, one of them held my date up against the building while three of them tried to take me down. I waltzed them out in the middle of the street where we were stopping traffic. And when people, when traffic stopped on both sides of us with their headlights on, it was night, blowing their horns, these guys freaked out and ran and turned us loose. Okay, but well, what does that happen? Right, that, that, okay, I, I'm just telling you, that's the only two times in my life that I have used violence, and it was both times in self-defense. That's it. I'm, I'm not a criminal. I'm not a, a bad person. I have not been violent. I'm not. Well, you know, you, you not, didn't respond other I'm than that saying person. no. This, this, this person. When there, are, that when there are court records that show that you beat the shit out of Beth Fields. Uh, you you know, beat the crap out of her. There is no court record. Then how, how was she able to get a restraining order against you? Okay. She, she, I, she called me down to the courthouse, and I got in a room with her and two two or three guys, two, I uh, know, and we sat there and talked for, 30, for like 15, 10, 15 minutes, and, and, and she told them her version of what happened. I told them my version of what happened. They weren't that far apart. Other than the fact that you no, beat no, the crap no. out of her? I, 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 that was not that was not true. Okay, so so after like ten or fifteen minutes of us, all of us talking, we were all laughing. The the, the two deputies and Beth and myself so? were all laughing. Okay, end the story. You know, no no uh, forget it. Okay, so I'm I walk out and I go to get in my truck. Beth follows me out and and halfway to my truck and ask me if she can come home with me, and does, and we screw each other's brains out for a couple of days. It's, it, that doesn't matter. That's, okay, that's, now it doesn't matter to you. No, it but doesn't matter, but the fact is that she, there was enough evidence for her to get a restraining order against you. That means no, 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 the no. And her story they, is... They, they, maybe, maybe there was enough, but she didn't. I mean, that was not... That was the end of it. But you, you're, just, you're just making... You, you sound like you read Jerry Mitchell's. Fed, no, you know that's. Fiction. I read that's the Tulsa, Oklahoma police report uh, case that's, file. Okay, listen. On that's, a net. Okay. I have read every yeah. police report, every case file ever written about you. Okay. Yeah. I don't get my information. Don't you forget? And you, you think it's all true? I know it's all true. Oh. Uh, you know. Wow. Don't forget that very first day that I met you. What did I tell you I did as a, for a living? And in, in, uh, private investigator. That's exactly it. And that is still what I do for a living. Right. I don't try to blame other people for my actions. So you're a Don, female Don Quixote. Sure. You call me what you want. What did you do to him all those years in Oklahoma? What did I do to him? Yeah. What did you do to him? I know what you did to him. I have confirmation what you did to him. You think I hadn't talked to him? From, from who? And, and, and they told you that I did some stuff to them. Yeah, and you kind of told, your, told on yourself, too, in those journals. Wow. Yeah. I babysat them. So. Yeah, you did want more than babysat them. Nope. You're never going to admit anything that you've done, are you? I, I, if what, anything that I've done, I mean... Everything in your life is always somebody else's fault. That, that's amazing. This is amazing. Everything in your life is always somebody else's fault, isn't it? No, 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 no. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you sound like a serial thing like Jerry I'm, Mitchell. I'm not a serial anything. You've made a serial thing out of me, though, in your mind, and so you're not interested in the truth. You're, you're Tell me the truth. You, I'm telling you. No, no, you dance around with bullshit and ego crap. Okay. Tell me the facts. Yeah. Tell me the facts. I have, and, and no, you, because you say, "Well, I don't remember." I don't. Bullshit! You remember? You don't want to tell me. I, I I tell you, I don't remember when I don't. We had a lot of fun together, all yeah. three of us. I'm sure pedophiles have fun with little no, kids. No, 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 no. I'm I'm not. You don't like the labels? That, I'm not. That's I'm icky, not, isn't it? I'm not that. I've never done that. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Where where you're you're so so why? You want me to tell you the facts, and then when I do, you're, you're no, telling me that no, I'm lying. No, you are lying, Felix. Uh, 
You are. Wow. I am an investigator, and that's what I do. I find out information, and I go after it, and I prove it either right or wrong. Okay. And I have proven more things right about you than wrong. And now is your chance to tell me whether it's true or not. And I have told you what's true. And but you won't explain anything away. You just gloss over it. I'm, I'm, there's nothing that I have done that needs to be explained away. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to Annette. What about her? Okay. You said the last time you saw her, you put her on a bus. That's true. Three weeks later, she was seen with you in another location. Yeah, we have witnesses to that. No. Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah. Well, you, you're going to tell me this thing is in blue right here? Because it goddamn sure is. It is. It's a fact. And, and these witnesses that saw us together yeah. three weeks after. Yeah. Three weeks after what? After you're saying you put her on a bus. I don't remember what the date was or that, but I... No, but you were on record early on in the investigation with Tulsa Police Department. I don't, I don't know about... You know, I don't know about the accuracy of... I mean, the bottom line is you know, you know, you can sit here and get past all your ego crap, but the bottom line is in the bottom of your heart, you know you're never getting out of here. You know that. So why not just I'm, tell the other two families about where their women are I'm, so that they can sleep at night? Do you sleep at night? Do you? Incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. You're incredible. Absolutely. I damn sure am incredible. Yeah. That's right. You know you're never getting out of here. No, I don't know that. I do. You're never getting out of here. No, that's not true. You're never going to get out of here, so why not just give the families closure? They, they had no right to arrest me. Bullshit. They had every right in the world. No, they didn't. They didn't have a... You thing. do not have the right to take someone else's life. No, of course not. And you have. I never have. Why? The only time I even any other people were the two times that I told you about. That's that a one, lie. That one, well, okay. That's... Well, that was intense, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, can you imagine going into the jailhouse or the prison to confront a guy that is going to face charges? Well, and the other fascinating thing here, Captain, is we have, yes, Gina is a private investigator. That is what she does for her career. But mm -hmm. if you heard early in the interview, she says that from time to time she will take on these cold cases pro bono because she she wants justice for these families. Mm -hmm. You know, she's essentially doing what a lot of the armchair detectives and web sleuthers wish they could be out doing. Right. The difference here is she put herself in in the way of harm, you know, right. she put herself in the lion's den. She went and knocked on his door and sat in his home and spoke and it, with somebody that she suspected to be a multiple murder. Right. And had to stare in his eyes and uh, smell his B.O. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, ultimately, Felix Vale was convicted of the murder of his first wife, Mary Horton Vale, who was found decades before mm -hmm. dead in a river near their home. Unfortunately, regarding the disappearance of Sharon Hensley, and Annette Carver Vale. There's been no justice in those two cases. Uh, I do want to point out some people that that really made this come true. You know, this this is something that should have been worked out decades before. It would have never gotten done if it wasn't for people like Gina Frenzel, the private investigator that we spoke with, Jerry Mitchell, the investigative journalist who kept these stories alive, and the mother of Annette, Mary Rose. Now, Mary Rose has stated that she is disappointed that they didn't have enough evidence to charge Felix with the disappearance or death of her daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but she has some closure in the fact that she knows that the man she suspects and has always suspected of killing her daughter is now in prison. And he will be there until the day he dies. Well, and... Uh, one of the things that I just find so fascinating uh, coming from the true crime world is how many audiobooks have we listened to? How many podcasts have we listened to? How many books have we read 
and we get we dive into a case mm -hmm. and we start doing a little bit of work ourselves and it was the same thing here private private investigator or not that that's what happened she read this book she got invested and then she did work and she b was able to uh, uncover some stuff for the, for the prosecution she became a witness for the prosecution um very interesting story and then to have her being confronted and so, a tough cookie right mm -hmm. to have her confront him at the end of the day in jail before the trial um i'm sure when he saw uh her at trial uh, he almost pooped his pants <laughs> well i do want to point out here uh that that the uh, cases like this provide hope and should provide hope to families and friends and communities of lost loved ones from years ago. Mm -hmm. A case doesn't have to go cold. And I want to thank Mary Rose, Jerry Mitchell, and especially Gina Frenzel for working this case and, and bringing that hope back to all of us that look into these cold cases. And we just want to thank private investigator Gina for talking with us. And we... We were interested in this, bringing this as a story or episodes to our show, just to kind of show a different side. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, instead of us just sitting in the garage and talking, there's there's a lot of different facets uh, of the investigation process to bring justice that are definitely interesting. Uh, do we have a recommended reading for this week? Uh, yes, this week we are recommending American Kingpin by Nick Bilton. Uh, in 2011, a programmer launched the ultimate free market called the Silk Road on a website hosted on the dark web where anyone could trade drugs, hacking, software, forged passports, counterfeit money, poisons without Big Brother keeping an eye on things. Mm -hmm. After a while, the media got wind and the new website where teenagers, dealers, hackers and terrorists could buy and sell contraband detection free was investigated. This is the true story of the epic hunt for the criminal mastermind behind the Silk Road. So check out American Kingpin by Nick Bilton. And you can do that by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page. You'll see all of our recommended books and movies there. And if you want to purchase anything, just use our Amazon banner. And today's show sponsor is Talkspace, the online therapy company that believes therapy should be affordable, confidential, and convenient. Talkspace therapists can put you on a path to a happier life. For a special offer to our listeners, visit Talkspace.com slash garage. Again, that's Talkspace.com slash garage. I use them, love them. Check out Talkspace.com. I want to thank you, Captain, for another great week here in the garage. Well, maybe next week you'll let me talk. We will we'll think about that. And I want to thank everybody for listening, subscribing, telling a friend.